I'm Andreas Wolf. I'm a GP principal. I work in Darlington. And I spend half of my working week uh, as a GP with a special interest in cardiology, treating mainly patients with heart rhythm disorders, the Westcliff Cardiology Service in Shipley. Procedures might be preferable to drugs, uh, firstly if patients are symptomatic and uh, a procedure can actually achieve a cure from a particular arrhythmia which uh, um, leaves the patient symptom free for the rest of their lives without having to take medication. Um, also quite often antiarrhythmic drugs for example are not particularly effective in treating arrhythmias and uh, procedures might come in uh, when drug treatment is ineffective. Patients need to be symptomatic. There will be arrhythmias which are very significant in terms of uh, um, prognosis, but uh, uh, they might not cause many symptoms. And in which case, um, if you have uh, drugs which reduce risk and uh, the pr procedure doesn't add any, any symptom improvement, then this will be a, a, a situation where you would prefer drugs over, over procedures. There are instances when procedures are not uh, considered early enough in the treatment of uh, patients. For example, in atrial fibrillation, where uh, if the treatment is treated early enough in a, a paroxysmal intermittent phase, then treatment outcomes uh, are generally better. Uh, also, there's no point leaving patients symptomatic, uh, requiring uh, excessive uh, amounts of drug treatment and hospital admissions before uh, finally an effective treatment is offered. It can also mean in those circumstances not just a benefit for patients but also a reduction in, in the care costs. There are only a handful of uh, antiarrhythmic drugs uh, commonly prescribed for uh, arrhythmias um, and this really depends on what type of uh, uh, arrhythmia a person has. Um, for example, if you have um, uh, atrial fibrillation, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, common uh, type of drug is uh, class 1c antiarrhythmics like flaconite, propafenone uh, or similar. Um, and uh, other drugs used in this setting are, for example, uh, class 3 antiarrhythmics like amiodarone and dronadarone. Um, it all depends on what underlying heart condition the person has. Uh, for example, if they have other coexisting heart disease, then uh, it leaves very little choice and uh, you have to uh, reach for drugs like amiodarone because uh, other drugs carry excessive risks in this setting. Um, for, for ventricular arrhythmias, uh, antiarrhythmic drugs aren't used very often, but amiodarone certainly would be the most commonly used drug there. Uh, there are a couple of others, but uh, yeah, it's quite unusual. So the most common drugs are amiodarone, dronadarone, flaconide, propafenone. When we're talking about commonly prescribed drugs for arrhythmias, uh, we can broadly categorize them into two groups, uh, antiarrhythmic drugs, treating the, the rhythm per se, uh, and uh, drugs treating the associated uh, risk from arrhythmias, and that's predominantly uh, thromboembolic risk, so we're talking about anticoagulation. Um, in terms of which drug is right for me, it depends on a number of factors. What arrhythmia are we talking about and what are, are the coexisting uh, heart disease or other conditions the person might have? Um, so for example, if you have somebody who has atrial fibrillation, um, has also got heart failure, uh, this uh, narrows your choice of treatment uh, uh, very quickly, uh, which excludes, for example, all the uh, class 1 antiarrhythmic drugs for, for treatment of atrial fibrillation, and you will so, uh, look straight to anticoagulants for, for thromboembolic risk prevention. Um, and the most commonly drugs used there are, of course, warfarin, and there are a number of uh, novel oral anticoagulants available um, and they're finding their place at the moment and there are two available which are called the Bigatran and Rivaroxaban. Uh, 
It's, it is unfortunately true that uh, aspirin is still used for stroke prevention in atrial fibrillation. And if you look at some national databases, uh, uh, you will find that uh, of high-risk patients, only about 50% receive anticoagulation, and the majority of those not on anticoagulation are treated with antiplatelet drugs like aspirin. And uh, there's no doubt that this needs to change. Uh, antiplatelet agents uh, have been shown repeatedly uh, to have very little impact in preventing thromboembolic strokes in patients with atrial fibrillation, um, whereas uh, anticoagulants are exceptionally effective in doing so. And uh, a number of, of uh, relatively recently published guidelines have addressed this issue. So it's a matter of uh, um, making sure that guidelines are adhered to. There are various tools GPs have available to help us uh, uh, diagnose and treat arrhythmias. Um, if you look at, uh, at education, um, there are various uh, toolkits available, for example, from the Atrial Fibrillation Association, uh, which uh, help primary care in uh, diagnosing and treating this condition better. But there are also tools available uh, for patients to uh, make it easier for their treating physician to uh, come to a diagnosis and uh, referring there especially to the uh, patient checklists for a number of conditions like atrial fibrillation but also for blackouts and similar. Um, and there are other um, more software based uh, tools available for GPs to improve the the, the treatment of arrhythmias, uh, uh, there's for example a, a tool called GRASP-AF which uh, addresses particular uh, the thromboembolic risk uh, prevention in, in atrial fibrillation and uh, there, there are others. Um, on top of that, uh, if you look more towards um, um, uh, uh, investigation techniques in, in diagnosing, atri uh, in diagnosing arrhythmias per se, uh, lots of GPs now have access to um, open access to, to ambulatory heart rhythm monitors and uh, this certainly uh, helps but it's important that this is coupled with uh, education that these uh, uh, tools are used as effectively and appropriately as possible. If I would have to pick one thing which is the best uh, for in, at Heart Rhythm Congress, and I think it's the, uh, virtually every heart rhythm specialist who plays an important role in the UK uh, attends here, and uh, there's chance in, in speaking to them and uh, exchanging ideas.